Thank you. Hi, Carol. Can you hear me well? I can hear you fine. Excellent. So you're live in our meeting now. Uh, the French people are watching you at the screen, including okay. Kais and uh, Dr. Walpole from the Philippines. And uh, maybe you can move your presentation on, on your screen so we can see it from here. Certainly. Let's see. Give me give me just a moment to share the screen. Are you seeing us? Okay, good. There. Yes, excellent. Yeah, we can see it now. <laughs> Wonderful. Very good. I hope you turned your Skype notifications on the second time. I did indeed. Excellent. Yeah, <laughs> less efficient with that than a presentation. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Carol. And uh, please go ahead. I think so. Thank you. And um, uh, thank you to Greenpeace. and. Thank you uh, to the members of the commission for this opportunity to share a presentation on Royal Dutch Shell and its knowledge and awareness of climate risks in the period between 1958 and 1998. Seattle is a not-for-profit legal organization headquartered in the United States and with offices in Geneva, Switzerland. We use the power of law to protect the environment promote human rights, and ensure a just and sustainable society. This is the latest in a series of presentations we've made to the Commission on the early history of oil industry research and knowledge um, into climate change. I will minimize to the extent possible um, any representation or repetition of previous presentations except where it's, it's necessary to, to put Shell's knowledge in context. In 2014, a researcher by the name of Richard Heady of the Climate Accountability Institute released a landmark paper that attributed two-thirds of greenhouse gas, industrial greenhouse gas emissions during the industrial era to 90 fossil fuel and cement producers. Royal Dutch Shell was ranked sixth among all investor and state-owned entities in that list, contributing to 2.12% of global greenhouse emissions during the period from 1751 to 2010. Looking at investor-owned entities alone, Royal Dutch Shell ranked fourth among all investor-owned entities in its contributions to global greenhouse emissions during that period. Accordingly, Royal Dutch Shell is increasingly being recognized as a leading contributor not only to greenhouse gas emissions, but to the impacts that are arising from those emissions, including not only atmospheric rises in CO2, but the attendant increases in global sea surface, global mean temperatures, global sea surface levels, and the occurrence and intensity of extreme weather events. This gives rise to the question, is it appropriate to hold Shell and other oil companies responsible for the impacts of their, their products and the impacts of their knowledge? When do we hold someone responsible for an outcome? Traditionally, under both human rights law and the law of tort, in multiple domains, there are three related elements. An entity needs the capacity to foresee the harm, an opportunity to avoid the harm, and they need to have failed to take reasonable measures to do so. So, did Shell have the opportunity to foresee the potential harms arising from climate change? We know that by 1958, Shell was an active participant in the American Petroleum Institute's Smoke and Fumes Committee, which was 
undertaking joint research into an array of air pollutants, including, by 1958, the occurrence of carbon of fossil fuel origin in the atmosphere. We know this because in 1958, a Shell executive produced the report covering that research. That same year, this same Shell executive acknowledged in a report to the U.S. government that the petroleum industry considered itself responsible not only for pollutants arising from its own operations, but for pollutants that would arise from the use of petroleum and its products. In other words, by 1958, the oil industry recognized, as it should have, that pollution arising from the use of oil was the oil industry's responsibility. It's in that context that the warning the industry received in 1959 from Edward Teller becomes so stark. In 1959, leading oil executives were warned by Nobel laureate Edward Teller that temperature rises corresponding to a 10% increase in carbon dioxide would be sufficient to melt polar ice caps, submerge the city of New York, put coastal cities around the world in jeopardy, and threaten a considerable proportion of the human race. Beyond the Teller warning, we know that Shell executives themselves received similar warnings. In 1962, Shell's chief consulting geologist, M. King Hubbard, presented a book-length survey on the world's energy resources. That survey was authoritative in every sense. It looked at global energy consumption over spans of decades and out into decades to centuries in the future. It looked at, at population projections. It looked at consumptions across countries, across regions, across continents. And it looked in detail at the world's energy balance and how that balance was altered by human activity. In that report, Hubbard acknowledged warnings that he and others had received from, from a Columbia University professor who warned that CO2 is seriously contaminating the Earth's atmosphere, that concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere since 1900 had already increased by 10%, and that these increases, should they continue, could have profound effects on both the weather and on the Earth's ecosystems and ecological balances. Hutch Hutchinson thus warned the participants, and Hubbard communicated this warning back to Shell, that serious consider consideration needed to be given to the maximum utilization of solar energy. From 1962, the warnings to Shell and other industry participants about climate risks grew protect progressively more frequent and progressively more stark. In 1968, scientists Elmer, uh, Eugene Robinson and Elmer Robbins presented the findings of a multi-year research report that they had prepared for the American Petroleum Institute on the sources, abundance, and fate of gaseous atmospheric pollutants resulting from fossil fuels. They cautioned that rising levels of CO2 would likely result in rising global temperatures, and that these increases could lead to melting ice caps, rising sea levels, warming oceans, and serious environmental damage on a global scale. Robinson and Robbins warned the companies that fossil fuel burning provided the best explanation for why CO2 was accumulating in the atmosphere. They acknowledged that the existing science on this was detailed and that it seemed to adequately explain the present state of CO2 in the atmosphere and emphasized that the priority for research should be into systems in which CO2 emissions would be brought under control. It's important to recognize that the industry received this warning more than half a century ago. In 1969, Robinson and Robbins submitted a supplemental report which re-emphasized their findings. While they acknowledged some uncertainties, they highlighted 
the irony that air pollution technologies that were were primarily focused on small scale localized pollution, whereas abundant pollutants such as CO2 were being generally ignored, even though they could be the cause of serious worldwide environmental changes. Shell was among the many oil companies that were members of API when these, this report was prepared and submitted. That alone cannot demonstrate, of course, that Shell saw the report. But other industry documents do demonstrate that Shell was aware of this report. In 1972, the oil industry submitted a report to the U.S. government on environmental conservation in the oil and gas industries. They explicitly acknowledged the work of Robinson and Robbins on atmospheric trace gases. They emphasized that this study was careful and that Robinson and Robinson's, Robinson and Robbins themselves were eminent experts. Notwithstanding this, the oil industry in their presentation to the government in 1972 explicitly disregarded the warnings from Robinson and Robbins and chose instead to emphasize an earlier study from a non-industry source on the question of CO2 and climate change. We can document that Shell Oil was among the steering committee and task force members that were responsible for writing these sections of the 1972 report. By 1988, Shell's internal discussions on climate change and climate risk had become robust. In 1988, Shell published an internal report first produced in 1986 that acknowledged the extent and potential severity of climate risks. It acknowledged that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere was increasing and would continue to do so, and that the primary explanation was the combustion of fossil fuels. It noted that sophisticated geocomputer modeling, geophysical modeling, showed that continued increases would lead to dramatic increases in global temperatures. And that if these temp ch changes occurred, it would lead, give rise to sea level increases, changes in ocean currents, and changes in precipitation patterns, and regional and temperature, temperature and weather, and that these changes would be unprecedented on the time scale of human history. Not only would they be unprecedented, Shell acknowledged, they would have impacts on the human environment, on future living standards, on food supplies, and on social economic, and political situations worldwide. <clears throat> they further acknowledge that by the time global warming becomes detectable in the science, it could be too late to take effective countermeasures to reduce the effects. Shell did another significant thing in this 1988 report because it calculated its own contributions to the problem. Shell ca calculated in 1988 that in a single year, Shell's own products were responsible for 4% of the CO2 emitted worldwide. This figure is notable for three reasons. First, it echoes Shell's warning to the, Shell's acknowledgement to the government in 1958 that the industry is responsible for the use of its products and pollutions resulting from that use. Second, it demonstrates that it is possible for a company to calculate its own contribution to those emissions. And third and most tellingly, Shell's calculation is not dramatically different from the figures that were calculated for Shell for that same year, decades later by Climate, Account Climate Accountability Institute, UCS and others. What did Shell do with this information? Shell concluded in the 1988 report that climate change would affect not only the world, but Shell's own operations, including having direct operational consequences on offshore installations and coastal facilities. Here, at least, Shell responded. In, 19, in 1989, Shell announced that it would be investing millions of dollars to raise 
natural gas platforms to make them more resilient in the face of, of anticipated sea level rise driven by climate change. By 1991, Shell was explicitly acknowledging an array of potential impacts of climate change. In 1991, Shell released a film, Climate of Concern, that acknowledged that climate might change too fast, perhaps, for life to adapt without severe dislocation. It acknowledged the increasing frequency of abnormal weather, saltwater intrusion into coastal ecosystems, sea level rise, increasingly destructive storm surges, and the displacement of people living on low-lying islands. Indeed, Shell envisioned the risk of potential greenhouse gas refugees uh, caused by shifting climates. Shell again acknowledged that global warming is not yet certain, but that many recognize that to wait for final proof would be irresponsible. In 1991, Shell said, action now is the only safe insurance. Thus, by the beginning of the 1990s, we can document that Shell, like other oil companies, could foresee an array of hazards arising from the combustion of its products, rising global temperatures, sea ice melt, rising sea levels, potential inundation of low-lying areas, effects on agriculture, changes to species distribution, and more severe extreme weather events. Shell could also foresee the potential victims of those impacts. Those lying in low-lying countries and coastal areas were uniquely available, uh, uniquely vulnerable. Regions that were already subject to severe storms, which could be worse. Economies that were, were reliant on agriculture or fisheries, and Shell acknowledged the poorest countries were among those at greatest risk. Notwithstanding this knowledge, however, and contrary to its widely accepted public image, Shell continued for decades thereafter to maintain an active membership in an array of industry groups and front groups that carried out an ongoing campaign of climate denial and climate obstruction. Even as it did so, Shell recognized that existing and expected oil and gas resources alone could drive global atmospheric CO2 concentrations above 400 parts per million. When unconventional oil and gas were added to that mix, the, the impact would go above 600 parts per million. Coal could add another 1,000 parts per million of CO2 to the atmosphere. The company understood well the potential stakes for that continued production. It also understood and foresaw the risk to the company. In 1998, Shell produced a scenario document that modeled potential, potential social, economic, and environmental situations worldwide through the year 2020 to project how they would affect Shell's own operations. In that scenario, Shell recognized that US failure to ratify the Kyoto Protocol could lead to rising CO2 in the atmosphere, rising impacts from climate change, and rising public outrage about the failure to respond to a growing crisis. Shell hypothesized in 1998 that in 2010, a series of violent storms could cause extensive damage to the eastern coast of the US. And that as a result of those storms, environmental NGOs might bring class action suits both against the United States government and against fossil fuel companies on the grounds that they have neglected what scientists, including their own scientists, have been saying for years about climate risks. Indeed, Shell acknowledged that the oil industry could find itself in precisely the same situation that the tobacco industry had found itself in. And yet, notwithstanding that knowledge, Shell continued and continues today 
to dramatically increase its production and its marketing of fossil fuels. So the question arises, did Shell have notice? Could it have known? The evidence is clear. Shell was aware of the risks. Shell was aware of the consequences. Shell took a calculated gamble that those consequences would fall on the world, but not on the company itself. The question for the commission is, was that gamble responsible in light of what we now know about the human rights impacts of climate change? Thank you.